At number 10, we have Sandman. Although his redemption arc is really great and has so much potential, it sort of falls flat. Basically, the thing one day sits Sandman down and tries to turn him to the good side, and it works. With Sandman now finding his stride as a hero, he first joins the Outlaws, a team of reformed Spider-Man enemies, and is then given a membership to the Avengers. It's all going in the right direction for the former villain until he's promptly hypnotized by Wizard and turned back to the dark side. Honestly, this isn't even Sandman's fault, but his quick turn back to evil gets in the way of him being anything close to a functional member of the Avengers. I almost didn't even put him on the list just because he barely even does anything for the team after he's inducted. And even tragically after that, he even goes off to reform the Sinister Six right after leaving the Avengers Reserve, which basically erases any good he may have done during his time as an Avenger. At number nine, we have Justice, FKA Marvel Boy. Although he's known as a pretty well-respected hero, at least in his later years, Justice still doesn't do much for the Avengers during his time with them. When he first joins, he comes off as more of a fan than anything else, making some rookie mistakes right off the bat. He also finds a way to break his leg, which isn't very common for a superhero. Much of his lack of maturity in the group is due to his worship for the other members of the Avengers, so it's hard to blame him, although he does do some pretty good work in planning to take down Ultron. Later, he ends up teaching for the Avengers Academy alongside Hank Pym, Tigra, Quicksilver, and Speedball. But overall, this character's time with the Avengers is wrought with scattered accomplishments and distracting love triangle storylines that just make him a much less effective member of the team. At number eight is Sentry, who joins the Mighty Avengers after having one foot in the door of the new Avengers for a while. This guy is a poor addition to the team simply based on issues of power imbalance and, unfortunately, his own mental health. On the power side of things, he's so powerful that he sort of drowns out the efforts of the Avengers as a team, which in many ways is a good problem to have. But on top of this, due to his mental health issues, he tends to have trouble reining in his power set and often second guesses himself. I feel badly for the Sentry, and I only put him on this list because sometimes people just aren't right for a big team. When it becomes clear that Sentry is fighting some internal battles, he is still known as the most powerful member of the team, but just needs to figure himself out first. For example, at one point, Sentry attacks Ultron at a moment when the team needed him to hold back and sort of ruins the whole plan. Although the attack was in retaliation for Ultron seemingly killing his wife, so it's not that unexpected. It's just one of the many times that Sentry has troubles keeping his composure and taking on the responsibilities of an Avenger. He's not a bad hero, just maybe not right for the best superhero alliance ever created. Number seven, Inhumans in general. I don't dislike the Inhumans, but what I'm not a fan of is how much Marvel tried to make them the new mutants, all because they no longer own the rights to the super successful X-Men. Marvel attempted to elevate Inhumans to new heights, hoping they'd become popular enough to rival their mutant crew, who was making a ton of other people money over at Fox. When this plan didn't end up working out, the Inhumans instead were just tossed aside and many of them would end up being killed off. The Inhumans are great, but trying to make them into something they're not, then discarding them when it didn't pan out was pretty not cool. The Inhumans deserve to be loved for who they are. They're basically like Marvel's superhero version of the British Royals, and I love them for that. Let's not try to make them mutants. That's, that's not what they are. At number six, we have Swordsman. With the biggest accolade being that he trains Hawkeye, it's hard not to squeeze this guy onto the list. Basically, Swordsman starts off as a circus performer who is known for demonstrating his mastery with bladed weaponry. He was more of a showman than a superhero realistically, and also more of a villain than a superhero, if we're being honest. After losing all his money due to his gambling addiction, he decides to steal from the carnival paymaster, and when a young Hawkeye chases him, Swordsman almost kills his own apprentice. And then, fast forwarding, the way that he's eventually admitted into the Avengers is basically through fraud. He teams up with Mandarin and sends a fake message posing as Iron Man to the Avengers to allow himself into the group. And it works. Being a double agent for Mandarin, he later lures the Avengers into a with the intention of blowing them up. Although he does try to dismantle it in a moment of regret, he's still dejected from the Avengers anyway. 
I think they just sensed he was screwing around with them. He then basically just falls back into a life of crime while picking up a drinking habit along the way which isn't part of the reason I put him on the list. This is kind of sad. He's a very troubled character and just had some nasty intentions and tendencies. Not the most noble of the Avengers by any means. At number five is Rage. This guy holds the accolade of being the youngest to ever join the Avengers, but not much else. And this wasn't by design. Rage's powers were acquired by an exposure to toxic waste, which actually gives him the body of a full grown man. Even though he's only 13 in reality. So when he joins the Avengers, he does it under false pretenses, fooling even Captain America into thinking he is a suitable age for the team. And even though they do give Spider-Man a membership to the team, he's always been known as an exception to this no teenagers rule. The protocol is typically to keep the team consisting of physically and mentally mature heroes who can handle extremely high stakes situations without issue. And unfortunately, Rage's failure to do that is what makes him one of the worst Avengers. He just shows a pretty immature disposition and it sort of overshadows his abilities as a hero. And failing to hide this immaturity, he also finds himself on the outs of the Avengers a bit earlier than he may have hoped. Not in the most gracious fashion either. Captain America basically catches on and fires him off the team once he realizes that Somewhere deep down, he's just a mere middle schooler. At number four, we have Stingray. This guy isn't ever really a true member of the Avengers. He is officially, but he only seems to jump on as part of the group when they need him, like when they need access to his underwater hydro base or when an inverted Doctor Doom brings him on to rescue civilians from a river. He's sort of their fringe friend that they use for water-related issues. Could this be a case of lazy writing? Perhaps but it seems more like he's not really a strong enough character to do much more than pop in and out of the scene when water gets involved. He also almost fights Iron Man due to a misunderstanding right when he joins the team and even campaigns to have him removed from the Avengers, which is just an awful way to start. Number three, mistreatment of Miss Marvel. Ugh, it's so bad. Anytime I go back to Miss Marvel's random pregnancy, it just makes me like, grimace. And I don't know what's actually worse here. What happened to Carol or her so-called friends, the Avengers reaction to the red flags surrounding it and her own emotional pleas for assistance. Wanda, AKA the Scarlet Witch, at least tried to be there for Carol, but she also seemed to kind of be putting her own perspectives on child rearing on her friend. Well, Carol was decidedly disturbed to learn she had become pregnant without knowing how that happened or having a recollection of really sleeping with anyone, Wanda encourages Carol to be grateful because she herself cannot have children with her synthesoid husband, Vision. Which is just like, not your choice for everyone, okay? Okay, Wanda, I get that that's your choice and I respect it, girl, but like, you cannot put that on Carol. Do not be like, oh, how nice for you. I can't have kids, so you should just be happy, Carol. No, this is weird, it's a weird thing. You should not be happy, you should be weirded out. I can't get too much into detail on this story, to be honest, because of the rules of the YouTubes. But what I can say is that it involves Carol having a rapidly progressing mystery pregnancy and then giving birth to the person that also impregnated her, feeling compelled to leave her life behind to go with that person, but not really remembering why she has strong feelings for him. So yeah. Fortunately, Chris Claremont would try to atone for all the horrors that Carol suffered here in Avengers Annual Issue Number 10. But if you want to go back to reminisce on just how awful this plot and this story was, you can check it out starting at Avengers Issue 197. But you've been warned. You've been warned. At number two is D-Man or Demolition Man. This dude should never really have been brought on to join the Avengers. He's sort of just this unmotivated, scraggly guy with a horribly designed suit. He just steals Wolverines and Daredevil's costumes and makes a tragic mashup of the two. His origins are that he's basically a wrestler that was given superhuman strength before befriending Captain America. When Cap needs to reform the Avengers, he thinks it's a good idea to bring on D-Man to join the team. But this choice is pretty obviously out of sympathy for the guy because he doesn't really do much when he does join. He's then sort of left behind and lost in time, becoming more and more unmotivated as the years go on, eventually living in homelessness before becoming a sort of villain. Not the best track record for even an alum of the Avengers. But I can't totally rag on him. The Avengers have insanely high standards and some people just want to hang out and 
eat sub sandwiches. So that's D-Man. The number one spot on this list goes to Dr. Druid. Having been trained under the same mentor who trained Dr. Strange, you'd think this guy would have gone on to be a great member of the Avengers. Well, at first he wasn't actually known as such a bad hero by his own right, but after joining the team, it becomes pretty obvious that he wasn't destined for greatness. His attitude is arrogant, he carries a lot of insecurity about living in Strange's shadow for so long, and he also has a big weakness to the charm of women, proving him to have a pretty low emotional intelligence. And this is a pretty major fault when you're supposed to be an Avenger because you need to be able to have a strong character regardless of whatever your power set is. This also tends to lead him to be a subordinate to women in positions of power like Captain Marvel who he continually undermines until his disloyalty leads to her being seriously injured in battle. He then tries to convince everyone to name him the successor as the new chairman. This guy, Dr. Druid, was just kind of a weak-minded fool who was conniving and subordinate through and through. It's surprising he was ever brought on board with the Avengers because he really proves himself to be one of their weakest links while he's there. At number 10 we have Quake. Quake is originally a member of S.H.I.E.L.D. and is a decent hero himself, but he doesn't bring much to the table for the Avengers. One of her most notable contributions to the team is helping them take down the Phoenix Force, which is sort of a team effort more than anything. And her biggest task even in that battle is when she interrogates the X-Men. The main issue is that often Daisy Johnson aka Quake is better as a spy and a police agent than as a hero. She does have powers, but she spends more time interrogating people and doing more traditional police work than high level superhero work. Something that also seems a little counterproductive is that she is announced to the public as being part of the Avengers, sort of killing her anonymity as a special agent. This leaves her with a target on her back as a covert spy, and without her spy work, she doesn't really have the power set to really keep up with the other members of the Avengers. Although let's be honest, the standards for the Avengers are pretty high, and if you can find a way to stand out you're lucky. Quake had a way to stand out as the covert spy on the team, but this was cut short by this announcement by Captain America. Even if I'm over exaggerating the significance of that event though, she still just doesn't make a huge impact on the team, even as an undercover agent. At number 9 is Quasar. This hero is sort of like the Marvel equivalent to DC's Green Lantern, to the point where many people see him as a blatant ripoff. Starting off as a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, Wendell Elvis Vaughn comes across a set of power bands which he uses to gain superpowers and become designated as the protector of the universe. Where this character falls flat is simply in the way that he seems to waste his potential. His powers allow him to traverse the cosmos and extend the bandwidth of the Avengers into an intergalactic context. Although Thor does that a little bit, he could definitely have helped. But he doesn't really take advantage of these supreme abilities as much as he could. I mean, he's the protector of the universe. You'd think that his story would break some more ground and offer the Avengers a more exciting addition to their already enormous bandwidth of power, but he doesn't. These days the Guardians of the Galaxy seem to be filling the Avengers quotas for cosmic exploration and protection, which leaves Quasar feeling a little irrelevant. Maybe not a bad hero on his own, but he's criminally underdeveloped and a little bland considering the extent of his powers. At number 8 is Mantis. Mantis is also very powerful, but she doesn't really do much for the Avengers while she's part of the team. After officially joining the West Coast Avengers, she helps them take down Voice, which is basically the extent of her work with them before that version of her is killed. And what seems to be a theme with Mantis is getting other teams of superheroes to help her complete her own personal quests, like the time when she gets the West Coast Avengers to help get to the bottom of her issues during the Fragmented Mind storyline, or another time when she gets the Fantastic Four to help her figure out some other personal issues. She does some pretty heavy lifting in the Thanos War storyline, actually facing him one on one, ending up in a tie, but she's not officially an Avenger at that point. She also seems to stir up a lot of drama within the Avengers, getting caught in a bit of a love triangle with Swordsman and Vision. She's definitely not the worst of the Avengers, but she doesn't do much to help them during her short time with the membership. Besides, it's the West Coast Avengers, they're not really the most powerful or impactful iteration of the team either way. Don't kill me in the comments if you disagree, it's just what I'm gauging from the online conversation. At number 7 we have US Agent or John Walker. Formerly a stand in for Captain America, his true colors show when Steve Rogers returns and Walker is renamed US Agent, which is just a bunko name if you ask me. I had to put him on the list even though he does the honorable deed of taking over as Captain America when Steve Rogers goes 
a wall and becomes nomad. He's just a little too intense on the patriotism front and brings the team down as a result. A huge part of Steve Rogers' influence on the Avengers is his ability to shelve the burden of America's unofficial, but basically official superhero, and keep his intentions focused on acting in favor of others. He's able to put aside his pride and work for the team, whereas Walker does the opposite. He does work for the team, but it's a big lesson in the importance of good attitude because they have the same powers, but something about John Walker's suffocating patriotism and inherent arrogance that comes with it just proves that no one could do the job like Steve could. And once again, US Agent is just such a lame name to take on, unrelated. Especially after having gone as Captain America for a time, it's just, maybe I just feel badly for him in a way. At number six, we have Red Hulk. Another sort of pointless copy of an already established Avenger, Red Hulk just doesn't bring anything new to the table when he joins, and his attitude is just sort of unlikable at times. I know the Hulk isn't really known for his attitude either, but there's something about General Thaddeus Ross that doesn't really sit right. He's sort of like a stuck up army general who doesn't know how to turn off his critical edge and be a team player. Well, actually it's not sort of like that. He's just like that. That's what he, that's exactly what he is. Although when he turns into the Hulk, he does keep his rational thinking mind, which gives him a slight edge over the Hulk who basically has a one track mind to destroy everything in his path. But as good as this sounds, it sort of acts as a lesson to the Avengers in that even though the Hulk can be a lot at times, having a rational tactical mind inside the beast can also cause problems because in the case of General Thaddeus Ross, his tactical mind isn't the most cooperative or friendly when getting things done, and he just seems to put everyone off with his approach to collaboration. But he's still pretty strong, so we can't get too carried away here. After all, attitude isn't the only thing that should be considered when ranking the Avengers. But even then, when looking at his abilities, he's not much of a standout member of the team either. No matter which way you look at it, he's still just a different colored Hulk. They've already got a green one. Number five, Hank Pym's mental illness. All because there was no time for re-edits, Hank Pym would end up becoming known as a mentally unstable man who hurt his wife, Janet Van Dyne. But although I agree with the Avengers that Hank was no longer a good fit for the team at that time, what I disagree with was the implication that came along with this this whole instance. Hank Pym, even before this incident, has been known as a man who is not mentally stable. He had multiple personalities and had actually sort of kidnapped Janet while proposing to her. When his first wife was killed, he had a mental breakdown. Years later, Hank Pym would actually diagnose himself with bipolar disorder. But the most upsetting thing with Hank Pym isn't that he's mentally ill or really that he hurt Janet, although obviously that that's not good and I'm not condoning that. It's how his mental illness turned him from hero to villain. It's the way his mental illness was presented and was handled in the comics. Instead of trying to help Hank, he was shunned for his actions. It feels as though Marvel at the time was kind of saying, Hank is crazy, which makes him hurt people, which means he's a bad person. In other words, craziness or mental illness equals bad. And that is the thing that I don't like when we do in comics, and I feel like mental illness, it's hard to handle in comics because sometimes that's just where it goes. And it's like, that's not what mental illness is. It doesn't mean you're a bad person because you have an illness. Just cause you can't see it doesn't mean it's not real. At number four, we have Death Cry. This character has a very short run with the Avengers and doesn't really make a mark on the team in any significant way. What puts her so high on the list is that she actually forces her way onto the Avengers in a way that infuriates the other team members. Although part of me thinks this makes sense since she's a Shi'ar warrior who is actually commanded by the Empress to protect and ultimately join the Avengers. The only misstep here is that this isn't really her call to make. At least the part where she joins them for two reasons. Firstly, because she too is a teenager and that's a no-no for the Avengers, as discussed before. And secondly, because it's one thing to try and protect the Avengers, but getting an official membership takes a bit more than some altruistic bodyguarding. When she's first rejected by the team, she stays persistent and eventually sort of forces her way onto the team instead. But this doesn't last long as she's incinerated by Captain Universe, who doesn't even really mean to kill her in the first place. It's sort of her fault, realistically. She comes at him in one of her trademark berserker rages just because he takes a kill that she wanted for herself. So in self-defense, he raises a big ball of energy and she kind of just flies into it and just explodes. Not the most gracious ending to an Avengers member, capping off an equally ungracious lifespan. At number three is Star Fox. 
This guy is just a bad hero. He's not even really a hero. His powers are extremely problematic in that he can basically gain the love of a woman on command. But it's not really love because it's artificial and it only lasts for so long. So when he uses his powers, these women often wake up not knowing where they are or what they've done, which is naturally a pretty deplorable thing to inflict on a person with your powers. And he doesn't even seem to feel badly after it either. He just gets his clothes on and jumps out the window like, See you later. Good luck piecing together the last 12 hours. Otherwise known as Eros of Titan, this guy is actually Thanos' older brother, so this sort of explains the evil nature of his powers. At least in the comics, they're kind of aware of his nasty nature, because the woman who he's used his powers on eventually come out and sue him because of what he does, which has to be a first for a superhero. I'm honestly just surprised that this dude even had a membership to the Avengers in the first place. He just, just kind of sucks. At number two is Gilgamesh, or the Forgotten one and the second name is fitting because he really just doesn't do anything of substance for the team. He joins in issue number 300 of Avengers when the team is in the process of reforming. So I'm gonna chalk this up to a misstep in the writing process. My theory is that the writers thought that Gilgamesh would be a little bit more popular than he turns out to be. Although I don't know how that would be possible as well considering his costume which just like the previous entry, it's just, it's quite understandably known as one of the more boring and downright ugly costumes out of anyone on the Avengers. But besides that, his attitude is also known to be pretty arrogant and a little too proud. For instance, he often refers to himself as being in the higher ranks of the Ageless Eternals. And although he is immortal, you don't really go around pimping yourself like that. He has a lot of potential as a superhero for the team, but that's, all the more reason that Avengers fans have been disappointed in his weak and somewhat unlikable influence on the team. Finally, at number one, we have Triathlon, aka 3D Man. I was sad to have to do 3D Man dirty and put him at number one because I actually love this character, mainly because of how silly it is that he's based on the color palette of a pair of early 2000s 3D sunglasses, and how even sillier it is that his powers really have nothing to do with 3D anything. All these setbacks are the reason why I love this character, but I knew he had to make it onto the list if we made a part two, so here he is. And apparently a lot of people online agree that he's one of the all-time worst Avengers, so there is no better spot to honor him than at number one. Originally joining the Secret Avengers, Captain America makes 3D Man a member of the Initiative and puts him on the Hawaii team, which is self-explanatory. It's basically a team in charge of keeping watch over issues that take place in and around the state of Hawaii. And no diss to Hawaii, but there isn't much that goes on over there in the Marvel Universe, at least during 3D Man's run. One of his more notable acts as an Avenger is when he captures Scarlet Witch during the Axis storyline and brings her to a machine, Doctor Doom, in an effort to take her abilities. But he sort of drops the ball in this moment of glory and she escapes. Look, 3D Man isn't that bad. He's just a weird superhero that just doesn't really make much sense and the banality of his abilities sort of equate to his lack of usefulness as an Avenger at the end of the day. What can I say? Number 10, Civil War II. I mean, why did this fight even happen again? Because Carol, Carol believed in future vision? But Tony, well, he doesn't like future vision. What is happening? What, what is this story? Whereas with the first Civil War, where the feud was all about whether or not superheroes should be registered government officials, which had two clear sides that each had their own merits, here we're arguing about something that no one really cares about. Well, except for Carol and Tony, that is, I guess. Captain Marvel believed in the Inhuman Ulysses' visions and believed that they could actually be used, like in Minority Report, to prevent crime and destruction from happening before it took place. However, Iron Man argued that trusting these visions was dangerous, as it was possible that they were not guaranteed to happen. Overall, a lot of people got hurt, some even died, but we never really resolved the issue. The main takeaway was that Iron Man had been experimenting on himself and was now kind of part tech, and that Carol became a huge jerk. Thanks, Civil War II. Number nine, Clone Saga. There are a lot of things that I love about the Clone Saga, like all of the fantastic spider clones, but there are also some things that really bother me about it. Like the fact that readers potentially believed they were reading a Spider-Man Peter Parker story, only to later find out, dun dun dun, that it was actually a clone. What? 
I mean, you might have been one of the few people being like, no, 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 I don't believe any of this. That's actually Peter Parker. This other Ben Riley character, he's the clone, but yeah. The whole bait and switch here is the thing that just really gets me. That and the fact that there were so many insane tie-ins which make the Clone Saga confusing to read and follow up with, even in retrospect throughout issues. Never mind if you happen to be collecting the issues across all the series at the time of that event. Even the modern day recollections of Clone Saga are a mess. Number eight, Spider-Man's domestic dispute. So. This wasn't so much a dispute, I guess, as an accident, but it still seems weird to me that other characters have their lives completely destroyed because of something like this, and yet for Spider-Man, we never really held him accountable or really talked about it. It's like a weird double standard because I guess of how popular Peter Parker is. During the Clone Saga, there was a moment where Spider-Man accidentally hit Mary Jane without knowing that she was kind of like right by him. Except that Peter is insanely strong, sent her flying, and well, she was also pregnant at the time. I know Peter felt awful awful about this, but it's a little strange that not many other fans seem to echo Spider-Man's own disappointment in himself there. Especially considering that Hank Pym once hit Janet, and as a result was basically condemned and ostracized by the superhero community. And you know, I'm sure that Hank also didn't feel good about hitting Janet after either. So it's weird that we're all like, that was bad, but this is like, eh, so strange. At number seven, we have Ex Nihilo and Abyss. This pair of strange aliens actually joined the Avengers at one point, and it's a really strange addition to the team, to say the least, since they joined at the same time during the Infinity storyline, I figured I'd put them in the same entry here. These two aliens have so much power that where they really fail to make an impact is by not exploring these powers very much. This seems to be a theme in this second part, just heroes who have tons of power that they're never given the chance to use for whatever reasons. It also seems that these two extraterrestrials have their own cosmic destinies already planned out for them, and neither have much to do with the Avengers or any of their goals. My best guess is that writers included them in a moment when it made sense, but then after a while realized that they were too overpowered or not grounded enough as characters to serve the Avengers properly. Because looking back on them now, it's pretty apparent to fans online that they were never really fitting for the Avengers in the first place. Number six, no consequences for Iron Man. There was a time in the comics when Iron Man was a very bad dude. I mean, there's been a few times actually when he's been a really bad dude, but what I'm talking about here is following the events of Axis. When after being accidentally turned evil, Tony Stark worked hard to make sure his alignment was not reversed. He managed to stay as one of the few permanently flipped characters and did a lot of very bad things afterwards as as a result, but tried to initially play it off like he was actually the good Tony, but he wasn't. In the end, Tony would be forced to wipe his mind to protect secrets from Norman Osborn, who was put in charge after S.H.I.E.L.D. had disbanded. Tony would be able to recover from this catatonic state through recovering an older backup of his mind, one that fortunately didn't come with, you know, any of the knowledge of his evil deeds, because it was like from before, which meant no consequences for Tony, no guilty conscience, and even readers couldn't blame him for his actions back then because technically this was, in essence, good old Tony again. This wasn't like evil Tony, there, there was none of that in his mind. Not fair. Just because we love Iron Man in the MCU doesn't mean that Tony gets off the hook. At number five, we have Jack of Hearts. This guy is notoriously one of the worst Avengers because his most notable act as part of the team is murdering another one of the members. Although he does this while under the influence of Scarlet Witch, there's no hiding from something so brutal. I mean, the Avenger he kills is Ant-Man, who's a really important member of the team. Aside from this though, Jack of Hearts also just spends such a short time with the Avengers that even his heroic deeds are sort of weak, regardless of the tragedy. Being the 52nd member of the Avengers, he's brought on specifically to help take on Kang the Conqueror. They all team up with the Justice League and a huge battle goes down. And then promptly after this, Jack tragically decides he needs to end his own life for various reasons, taking a villain with him who had killed Ant-Man's daughter. But it's pretty ironic that the next time he makes an appearance, he blows himself up and takes Ant-Man with him. Just a messy run as an Avenger through and through. Number four, Peter and MJ's marriage. So many retcons, ah, so little time. A big plot point and retcon that I'm still waiting to be undone is the abolishment of Spider-Man and Mary Jane's marriage. I mean, I personally don't know if the two would actually still be together today if they're marriage had never been undone. It was always kind of rocky, and there were a lot of times that it felt like both partners could not meet the other's needs, which tended to cause 
well, a lot of colossal problems there. But MJ and Peter do really see each other, I think, and often because of this, because they both understand one another so well, they would more often than not manage to work through their problems together and make it out on the other side. But we never got a chance to see how the marriage played out because in one more day, their marriage was taken hostage by Mephisto. This is also just such a weird story. You know how I know? From trying to explain it to friends who don't read comics. That is a great way to test out how weird a story is. If you explain it to someone who doesn't read comics and they just like can't process it, it's there's something wrong with that story. <laughs> That's what I like to think. Like the source wall in DC. Try explaining that to people. I'm not knocking it, I'm just saying it's very out there. At number three is Thunderstrike, another knockoff character, except this guy is a knockoff of Thor who just doesn't find his footing with the Avengers. This is probably because of how similar he is to the already extremely popular hero when he's introduced in the late 80s. But this isn't a coincidence. Eric Masterson, aka Thunderstrike, first appears in Thor 391 and actually has a quick run as Thor before he's demoted to Thunderstrike. And even though he still remains relatively powerful, his influence just plateaus as soon as he's left to exist in the shadow of the much more popular Thor. And not to mention, his costume, it's just pretty weak. He looks like an aging biker who only shops at thrift stores. It might just be the case that Thunderstrike is meant to be a bit more of a relatable version of Thor that people could see themselves in, but after he joins the Avengers, it proves that he really has no distinct qualities that set him apart from the rest of the team. No offense to him though. It's tough when you're a carbon copy of the God of Thunder just with a worse outfit. Might just be bad luck or bad writing. More likely the second one. Number two, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver are not mutants. One of the worst things that has ever happened to the 616 universe, in my humble opinion, is the retcon of Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. No, I'm still not over it. I'm never gonna be over it. It needs to be fixed. Honestly, I enjoy silly retcons from time to time. The idea of retconning something as a plot device when needed, and especially when actually deployed to clean stuff up, does not bother me. However, this is something you need to be careful with, as retconning something like this, it can have repercussions that could extend beyond that one singular change. In the case of Wanda and Pietro, it made so much of their family history feel like empty and meaningless now in retrospect. There are stories that you'd go back to, like Vision and Wanda's miniseries together when Magneto shows up to pay the newlyweds a visit, that completely loses emotional weight. House of M is another storyline that gets emotionally derailed by this retcon. And then of course, there are the plot holes that this retcon created, like Wanda working with Hope Summers to get rid of the Phoenix Force. With this retcon in play, being that Hope is typically known for taking on other mutant-based powers and abilities, her boosting Wanda's power, it doesn't really make sense if Wanda isn't a mutant. So, what? Number one, 616 Gwen Stacy. To be clear, I don't actually have a problem with Gwen Stacy. I, I actually like her character and many other still alive versions of her from alternate realities. I'm typically a huge fan of those. What I don't like is how she was treated after her death. I'm not as conflicted as some Spider-Man fans about Gwen's death to begin with. I'm, I'm not like against her dying, but I'm not for her dying. But after she died, goodness, we should have just let the poor girl rest. Not only has she been brought back via clones, too many times, and it also never ends well, but we've also felt it necessary to give her a darker, more horrible past, because that's what she needed, with her becoming the very young mother to Norman Osborn's twins. Just why? Why? Just let Gwen Stacy rest in peace, I say. Let her rest in peace.